Well, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted, you know? <laughs> it, Christmas was great, wasn't it? Christmas, you know, great. New Year, maybe not so much, I don't know. But it is busy and it's exhausting and there's a lot of stuff going on. And afterwards, you can have that climb down afterwards, don't we? We've got a lot of stuff, we're having a good time, we're meeting people, all sorts of things going off and there's sort of a, a climb down straight after. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life. There's lots of trials, lots of burdens. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Usually Christmas is a good time of year, but that period of time afterwards, the January month, is a dark month, isn't it? You know, I actually think it's the 23rd of January. It's supposed to be the most depressing day of the year. But we're not quite there yet. We're not quite at full depression yet. We're on our way there. Okay. Well, we've just begun a series uh, going over four weeks on Sabbath rest. <laughs> And we're going to do this pointy thing at Helen all through this. Yeah, great. I can see on the screen. Sabbath rest here at the Beacon. Um, it's a four-part series. And we're going to look at uh, these four parts. Stop, rest, delight, and worship. And last week, Chrissy took us uh, all the way through stop, which was just simply stop. And today we're going to look at rest. So just a couple of things before we start. I just want to go uh, a quick... Uh, run through uh, our progress so far. The first step was to stop. And that sounds simple, but it's much harder than it would be, especially <laughs> in the culture that we live in. It's very difficult to do the basic root of Sabbath, which is stopping. But Chrissy gave us uh, three simple things that we can do. So if you want to practice sab Sabbath, there's just three things that we need to do. And one is to ask yourself, uh, what is your Sabbath community? Now, Sabbath community wasn't a large group of people. It was just two or three friends. Just two or three, maybe even just one. Grab one friend where you can meet together regularly in Sabbath. Two was to commit to a certain amount of time. It doesn't need to be a full day just yet. Remember, baby steps. We're just building something here. You're going against the tide of the culture. You can't just start straight away expecting to have a full day where you just commit yourself to Sabbath. Committing yourself to just maybe two to four hours is a good start to meeting up with somebody regularly once a week, two to four hours. And the third thing was just to practice it. Get doing it. Okay? Start somewhere. You're not going to be perfect at it, but start. If you've ever had an injury, if you've ever hurt yourself, it takes a little while for that healing process to happen. If you can't walk very well, it takes a little, bit, a little while for you to start walking properly before you can go to the shops, before you can go to Stafford Town Centre, before you go to the chase. So those are the three things to stop. Ask who's in your Sabbath community. Commit yourself, just a couple of hours, maybe two hours with those people, and stop practicing the Sabbath together and view to stop building the Sabbath life. So that's stop. Second thing I just wanted just to mention is just a point of clarification. I've had a few couple of conversations about this uh, during this week. It's been really good. I can see people here who are really interested in actually going and starting to do this thing called Sabbath rest. I'm really excited about it. But just some points of clarification. Um, we don't mean by Sabbath rest the Old Testament law has to be fulfilled as Christians. Okay? So we're not saying to you that you have to do a Sabbath day in order to make yourself right before God. Just to be clear, that happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Everything that we need to do to be right before God is in Jesus Christ. We are now free and there's no more condemnation. So we do not need to uh, do the law as the Israelites did. But we are free. And Colossians 2.16 says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or whether regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. No one pass judgment on you in regards to a Sabbath. No one can judge you. No one can condemn you. Why? Because Jesus Christ has done what was necessary and has set you free. So, that begs the question, why do this in the first place? <coughs> and the reason is, uh, 2 Timothy, great, thank you, Helen. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture, all Scripture, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh, you want to just pop back now? Thanks, great, thank you. 
Um, a few years ago, I took some friends of mine camping, and I like to think of myself as quite a good camper, like an expert camper, like I really love doing it, and I like to bring people along with me uh, camping, and I want to show them how it's done. And I've got a fire pit that I bring along with me, and I set up the fire in the camp, and we're going to have a fire. Is everything okay? Yes, okay. And we're going to have a fire, and everybody's going to stand around the fire, it's going to be a great thing. And when I took these uh, friends of mine camping, I noticed that they became incredibly anxious and wanted to prepare, really prepare for this camping event. I think, I don't know quite what was going through their mind, I don't think that was going to happen when we went camping, but they started bringing loads of stuff with them. Everything from sewing kits to like, uh, I don't know, like uh, alarm clocks and all sorts of stuff were in this bag full of stuff. And just in case, you know, pillows, the whole thing, right? And I started making fun of them, going, come on, you guys, pillows. You know, sewing kits, you don't need a sewing kit. So we get to the campsite and they unravel all their stuff. You know, after I've made fun of them, I'm still making fun of them, of course, I'm their friend, that's why I do. Okay, and then I get the, the fire ready and everybody's watching me get the fire ready and the fire's going really well, it's going really good, it's going to be fantastic. Everybody's looking forward to the fire. And then I start checking for the matches and I start looking around for the matches, the one thing I needed to bring to make this fire happen. And I realized I'd forgotten the one thing. And to this day, my friends have never let me forget <laughs> that event. God wants us to be prepared for the works of service that he wants us to do in our lives. Okay? He just wants us to prepare us, right? It's not we're doing a legal entitlement to make ourselves right before God. But having rest makes us equipped to do every good work. Okay, so bearing that in mind, let's have a look at rest. Rest is the end of the work and the beginning of trusting in God. And so there's two things we're going to look at rest today. First one is rest in the natural and rest in the spiritual. There's natural rest and the spiritual rest. Okay, let's have a look at natural first of all. <coughs> Thank you, Helen. Uh, this is Genesis 2, and it says in Genesis 2, if you want to read along with me, um, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. So God actually, within the fabric of nature, within the fabric of the reality that we're in, has created within it rest. And to deny that is to deny how things just are. The reality around us. To pretend that you can work like Elon Musk would say, 100 hours a week, it's just a lie. It's not true. God says, because he created the world in a certain way, there needs to be within the fabric of it rest. Now that's become increasingly difficult to do. It's really, partly because in our culture we don't value rest. We value <coughs> task-orientated goals over rest. But we're going to look how wrong that is in a second. And when I was at Oak Hill, which is a fantastic college, a brilliant, brilliant college, if you want to learn theology, I recommend Oak Hill. It's a great place to go. But they are very task orientated for sure. You're having to do 15,000 words a term, plus learn two ancient languages. I can tell you, it was very hard for me. Maybe not for some of the Oxbridge guys, but for me, it was very hard. I struggled through it. And they would have every term to sort of push back and all this kind of task related stuff that you have to do, read all these books and, and do all these essays. They'd have something called a quiet day, once a term. I was really looking forward to this quiet day. I thought it would be great if they went ahead about it. Great, a quiet day at the end of the term. It's going to be fantastic. And I look forward to the quiet day. And then the week before the quiet day, they give you a program. A program for a quiet day. And as I looked at this program for a quiet day, what I noticed was it was busier than my normal working day. There's one thing after another. I, there was a person coming to do a talk, then there was chapel, then there was a, something else before, and then there was this other thing that you were meant to go and do. It's like the way that they think, or I should, we all think, not just Old Kill, but we all think through a task-related way of the world, that you have to do things and orientate around things and, and trying to seek goals and finish them completely. <coughs> and it just doesn't fit in with a, a, a quiet day. And so even when somebody says, we're going to put it on a quiet day, you still think, ah, quiet day. Right, let's get down some things that we need to do. 
That's not what God calls rest. If you look at this passage above you, God calls rest the stopping of task oriented goals. And that's how I'm, I'm defining it, the task oriented goals. You're stopping these goals. Okay, and you're going to do something. You are going to work, do something on a, on, a, on a rest, but it's not going to be task oriented. Our culture is becoming more task oriented. And, and in fact, in uh, 2019, 81% of US uh, people in the US had smartphones. And everybody knows what one of these things does. The, the notifications, the pings, the emails. Um, I can't keep up. The amount of WhatsApp groups I, I'm a part of. Like, it's, I'm really sorry because I'm a part of some of your WhatsApp groups. I can't keep up with them. You know, there's so many people I've got to keep up. And they're just always task related. That in the past, we had these boundaries where procedures like that, where you went to work and then you had a period of time that wasn't task related. It was, now that boundary has been eroded more and more because of this, because I wake up in the morning, I stare at this, and it's got tasks that scroll through that I have to complete. 62% um, of workers on average admit that the quality of their work suffers at times because they can't sort through the information fast enough. It's a constant stream of task-oriented information coming to us. American professionals say they spend half the workday receiving and managing information alone. And that was in the work day. More and more that's bleeding into the natural barriers of rest that we should have. The time that we should protect our attention and resources and personal space. I mean, I remember there was a time I would be appalled at seeing somebody I hardly know's bedroom. But now, if I'm on a Zoom meeting with somebody, almost always there's one person that has to do their Zoom actually inside their bedroom. Or in their spare bedroom. So that was just a space that you just didn't bring people into that you didn't know. How quickly have we got used to that? And just think that's just the thing that we do now. All these lines are starting to blur. Task-oriented culture is, is encroaching on what we really need to do. So we need to fight back. And that's what we're doing here as a church. We're fighting back in Jesus and we're going to do rest. Mary Helen Imod Imordino Yang, I think I got her name right, of the University of Southern California, did some really good research on rest in the, in the natural. And she points to the fact that most of the research now suggests, fascinatingly, as they say, um, that being idle is anything but purposeless and unproductive. In fact, something else is going on when you stop. It's really interesting. This is the stuff, this is the modern research. This is where we are today. Inside your brain, you've got like networks, and I'm not a brain guy, so I'm not gonna tell you, I'm, this is the best that I can understand of the research. You've got networks, so one of them is a task-oriented network. It's a good thing. You need to go out and find goals and do them. But one other part of your brain, if you like, or network of your brain, is there to do rest. A study shows, and this is a bit technical, that that part of your brain is specifically recruited and specialized for processing abstract information relevant to psychological, affective, that's emotions, and subjective aspects of self and other people, both in everyday contexts and more complex moral and socio-emotional contexts. It's all the stuff that you need to do when you're not doing tasks. And your brain gets to work when you're not doing them. Your brain wants to be busy when you're idle. When you sit still and you do some rest, your brain gets working on thinking about, it's interesting, all the research shows your brain gets working on moral stuff. This is really interesting. It starts to ask the question, why am I doing all the tasks that I spend the rest of my week doing? It starts doing reflective stuff. It starts asking, like, why, why are other people doing and Why should I do that? What's going on in my life? How does that reflect on me? It starts figuring out where you are and the group of people that you spend time with. What's my relationships like with them? How do they function? Your brain will get to work when we stop and rest. Resting is a, not a, an absence of goal orientation outlook on life, but it's actually a way to stop processing and doing the things that we really need to do. It's not about achievement. Okay, so what does rest look like, essentially, you know? It could be lots of different things for different people, I imagine. My rest is going to be different from yours, okay? 
Um, I, um, I had a friend of mine, a guy called, L shall I say his name? I'll say it, he's probably never seen us. Uh, Lawrence Dipless, and he's this, I think I get his name right. And he was one of the students at a college. He was a great guy, a lovely guy, great preacher, godly man, uh, Superman. But one day, one Saturday, I happened to be in the monastery, which is the place where they built all the single guys at my college, they call it the monastery. And I was in there and I thought I was alone. And I walked to the kitchen and I found Lawrence in the kitchen on his laptop, looking at something that totally horrified me. And as I stared at his laptop and came a bit closer, I noticed that Lawrence was looking at a spreadsheet on the Saturday. So of course I was horrified and disgusted, and I went up to Lawrence and I said, Lawrence, mate, what's going on? Why are you looking at an Excel spreadsheet on a Saturday? And this is the thing I'll never forget. He turned to me and said, it just relaxes me. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a person. <laughs> oh yes, yes, I knew there was people like that. I knew. <laughs> cannot believe it. I'm not one of those people. Yes, well done for that. We'll pray for you after. But I'm not one of those people. I can't do it. I'm a very different sort of person. He just enjoys it. He enjoys an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Well, so this is very interesting. So what, I would go out for the weekend, and often I will come home to the monastery, and I'd come in uh, very late on a Sunday evening after I'd been out the whole weekend. Come home from Sunday evening, and Lawrence was always in the living room, sitting in the corner in his chair, reading the book. He's always there, I don't know why, every Sunday, like clockwork. And I would come in the room, and I would just stop telling him about my weekend. Not thinking about anything wrong, just tell him, how's it going, how are you going, and this is what happened, this is what I did, blah, 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 blah. And then one day, I was chatting with him, <laughs> And I was just telling him about my weekend and what was going on. And then after I did all that, he just stopped and looked at me and said, you know, when you tell me about your weekend, you fill me with all sorts of anxiety. And I kind of, I didn't even realize what it was in my life that was quite anxious proning in, in Lawrence, but I stopped on reflection. I can see there's some things that was, uh, it causes some anxiety. But Lawrence was just a very different person than me. You know, that, my weekend would not have been Lawrence's rest. Doing a spreadsheet would not have been Ian's rest. And you, well, each of you here has something that gives you rest. And that's great. It renews you. It means the parts of your brain that are not task oriented all the time get, get switched off for a while and you just go about your restfulness. So Sabbath in the nature and the natural is incredibly important because it stops us as task oriented culture and it stops us and allows us to do things that we enjoy and we find rest in and we can glory in God. In. And the third, second thing that task orientation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sabbath and rest does for us in, in, in the nature is that it's not about church and it's not about uh, just me getting rest. It's that kind of a cosmic ordering of things. I think if you can see on the screen here, you can see that God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested. It doesn't say that God just gave it to Adam or even his, uh, the people that he, um, his children. It's that God actually gave it to the whole cosmos, to everything. And actually, if you read through the Old Testament, God actually uh, complains against the Israelites because they are not giving Sabbath rest to the land and to animals. Sabbath rest was for everything. It's not just for me. So Sabbath is a time of community. It's a time for getting together with those twos and threes or with your family or with children and being part of something. I've got a friend of mine called AJ and I'm going to see him, well, I plan to see him this week. And uh, AJ went I, and when we get together, <laughs> we, we don't always do very much. I remember one day we went out for a breakfast. We do this thing when we get together, we, we, we hang out, we go for breakfast and we'll just go for breakfast for a couple of hours. And then we come back, and uh, when, I came, when we came back to AJ's, his, his wife, Heather, uh, said, oh, what did you get up to? What did you talk about? And then we stopped and paused for a moment, and we realized, yeah, nothing. <laughs> like, done nothing. We didn't talk about anything. I didn't hardly, maybe we had one or two jokes was in that whole time that we were together. But we basically sat at McDonald's, ate McDonald's breakfast, opened up a newspaper, and just sat there and rested. That was it. Sabbath doesn't need to be the busyness 
of life. And it's not just the absence of people. It's not sitting in your prayer closet praying to God all the time. Sabbath is actually spending time with people. And if you're one of the people that have children, and I don't have children, so I'm not giving, going to give you a pan answer to it, because it's very, very hard when you have children to find that rest. I want to sh show you that children are part of Sabbath. They're not, like, we don't need to exclude children from it. It's a very important thing. And even if you yourself don't feel rested because of all the busyness of life, of family life, know this, that you're having an effect on your children that will pay off later on down the road. They need that Sabbath rest. They need to be involved in the community. Okay, third thing in the nature, rest takes preparation. And if you're going to write down a verse, I'd like you to write this one down today. Yeah, thank you. Exodus 16, 5. Okay? This is really important. If you want to take uh, Sabbath time, you're going to do this, that we're, we're hoping, we're encouraging you all to do. It's going to take some preparation. It's not just going to happen easily. If you're preparing for a presentation at work, you wouldn't just uh, wait for that day and then just do a presentation. And if you think Sabbath rest is the absence of just being, or just being idle and it's not really that important, then you won't put the work in beforehand to make it important, to make it special. God says in uh, Exodus, he says, on the sixth day, when they, prepare, when they were to prepare, this is up to the Israelites, to pre prepare they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So God asked them to prepare beforehand, before that time came on. Do you see that in the text? Now this is not another task oriented to God. This is God asking us to trust him. So I know that your lives are all busy. For some reason, some of you are retired and your lives are busy. But it's very difficult, it's hard. But God is saying to us that he will make a way for rest to happen. He's asking us to prepare for it. Now that could be doing things like just making sure that you've cooked some dinner beforehand, that all you need to do is stick in the microwave. Okay, if you're going to do one of these Sabbath rests and you're going to bring people over, do not stop cooking the big meal for them. I know some of us just want to cook the big meal and impress our friends. Don't do that. Just stick some pizzas in the oven or stick some stuff in the microwave. But do it, freeze it up beforehand. Just do something practical. Or it could just be making sure that the chores that you might normally have done for that day, you do beforehand. God, even if it looks like, like this is the key thing, even if it looks like that's going to be very difficult, and, that, and it will, Trusting God in this matter, trusting Him, He will bring in twice as much as we gather daily. He promises to do that. If you do the Sabbath rest thing, what you're really doing is orientating your life around the fact that God is really God and you're not. The rest of your week is going to be about the fact that God is God and you're not. Okay, so that's the last thing about what it is in nature. In nature, we need to take the rest. This, all the studies show that actually rest is really important for our minds. So we need to prepare for that rest, we need to gather in community, and we need to take it seriously. Okay, the second thing we're going to look at is the spiritual. And I want us, if you've got a Bible, it's going to be on the screen. Ellen, do you mind? Oh, wow, that's terrible. We won't do that. <laughs> I'm going to read it from the Bible. So if you like to look up in Hebrews 4, if you've got a Bible there, we're going to look at the spiritual. Hebrews chapter 4. From verse 1. I'm going to do verse 1 to 18, I think. Oh, verse 1 to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4. Let me read it. Therefore, since the promise of entering rest still stands, let us be careful none of you be found to have fallen short of it. But we also have had good news proclaimed to us just as they did. By the message they had, but the message they had was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declare on my oath and my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. 
And again, in the passage above, it says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again sent a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time after he spoke through David, as the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. I'll leave it there. Anybody who believes in God rests from their works, just as God did from his. <coughs> this passage tells us that it was a Sabbath rest way before the Ten Commandments were given. Right back at the beginning of time, God placed a Sabbath rest in our hearts. <coughs> Without God doing the work for us, we will never enter true spiritual rest. And we can see that very much in the culture that we live in today. And more and more people are seeking Sabbath rest in things that are not God. And there's consequences for that. And there's studies showing that actually what people, it's really interesting, people are becoming addicted to social networks, even though, this is interesting, they, are, they find it incredibly stressful, anxious inducing, and they don't even like them. They started to hate them. You don't like the application. You hate it. You don't want to be a part of it. And you don't want to look at it. And yet, there's a greater uh, an increase in addiction to them. The Bible would not call that rest. The Bible would call that slavery. Very opposite of rest. And society is becoming more and more like that. Um, especially, I just had a really horrifying statistic. Really, I can't remember the statistic quite, but... Prostitution levels are increasing rapidly in modern cultures, and it's not because people are well out of job. It's because some um, young girls are finding uh, there's a, there's a line between being on social media and from social media to finding those likes, those little blue ticks, you know, the, the 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 affirmation, the validation that you get, and then moving from other platforms that I won't mention right now into a place where you're using your body. To get affirmation. And this has uh, started a trend in prostitution, just for young ladies. And some social commentators are saying that in about four to five years we're going to see the repercussions of this in our culture. The constant need for validation, for approval, for a sense of self worth, for people to look at you and say, You've done really well, good on you, you're better, you're great. People like you, the people around you like you. The constant need for that. You will never find rest in this life. All of us here struggle with that to some extent or another. Just ask a preacher. Preachers are, uh, struggle with this all the time. You have this thing called the Monday morning blues. It's like when you've preached all day and then you wake up Monday morning and you're like, well, what was that about? I don't even know if it connected with anyone. Like everybody struggles with this. But God says we can never enter any other rest. We can't find rest in our lives until our souls come to a stop. And the writer of Hebrews here that you can't see, I don't know whether you can highlight that, right at the bottom there. Can you move to the next one, is that? No? Yeah, just and one more, one more. Great. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for God's people. So Joshua, who had the law, didn't, uh, didn't achieve the rest that Israelites were looking for. There remains another rest for everybody, for the people of God. And that's found with people who have faith. We can find it with a chap called Moses. And Moses speaking with God, uh, just before he was going to go into the promised land, he's arguing with God about the Israelites. He's saying, God, look, if you don't go with us, it doesn't really matter. It's not really going to have any achieve anything. And God says to Moses, he says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. My presence, rest. Do you see the connection between those two things? This is the Sabbath rest for the people of God. We are saved, just as we were washing before, by all the works that Jesus Christ has done for us. 
And if that is the most important to thing to us in our lives, we will rest. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what we achieve in life. It doesn't matter really about the outcomes of our goal-oriented tasks. None of that matters anymore because everything has been achieved through and by Jesus Christ. I can live freely. It doesn't matter what you think about me. There's no condemnation now. That's all that matters. I can come to a rest. But God does something even greater than that. He gives me his rest, but he also gives me his presence. I have a friend of mine called, oh, shall I, if you, do, do you mind just moving the camera a little bit further down? Because I don't want people, and this might not be best if it doesn't go out on the, in, on the internet. But you can keep it on, but as long as it doesn't go on the screen. That's right, thanks. Um, does that make sense? As long as you don't see this. Can you see this? No, good. Okay, great. Um, sorry for the people watching this. I'm not going to, I just don't want people's names to be mentioned. Um, so I've got a friend of mine, and uh, she, She's the sort of person that lives by this. She loves the Lord's rest. She seeks that rest and that presence in her life. She, her whole life is given over to the fact that Jesus Christ has done everything for her so she doesn't need it. She could just rest. And she just, all that means is that she trusts him. And you can tell that by her prayer life and the things, she, things that happen in her life. A few years ago, um, her brother went from the country that she lives in and he went to live in Paris. And she was just praying for her brother, that her brother would just meet some friends. A friend who was a Christian, and a friend was into football. And she was hoping that that would happen. She was praying to the Lord, and she was trusting in him that God would give her the rest. And uh, one, uh, a few months later, she got a phone call from her brother saying that uh, he'd met someone. A met a friend who could speak a Brazilian, a Portuguese, and to uh, play football. He like, played football, he did just like he played it. And she's like, oh, that's really great, good, it's an answer to prayer. And then uh, she chatted with him a bit more, and apparently he didn't just play football, but he played for a football team. She was telling me this over the phone one day, he plays for this football team. I was like, oh, it's really interesting. Well, like a football team, yeah, yeah, apparently. Well, so the, what's the name of the football team? And she's like, oh, yeah, it's uh, Paris Saint Germain or something, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Paris Saint Germain? Are you sure Paris Saint-Germain? Yeah, 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 yeah. Paris Saint-Germain, something, I don't know. And what was his name? And uh, I won't mention his name, but if we can go to the next one. Okay, so you might not uh, know, he doesn't look like he does because he's got his hair back, but we'll show, I'll show you another picture in a second. This is my friend here, okay, and that's her brother, and brother's wife and a kid. And this is the, the guy here. He's a great Christian, a wonderful guy who loved my friend's brother, and uh, loves the Lord. And we can, I'll just show you the next picture. Is anybody, have you seen that guy? I don't know if you follow football. Okay, if you don't follow football, it's fine. But basically, he plays a really big player. Yes, and he plays for Brazil. Okay, and he loves the Lord Jesus. And uh, my friend, Mabella, um, was praying. And instead of just getting somebody, just anybody, this guy turned up in her life. I remember thinking about this to a friend a little while ago and saying, like, if I knew somebody like this, if uh, the Lord put something like this in my life, I would want him to be around a little bit. I'd like to introduce him to people. And my friend AJ just said to me, well, that's the reason why it doesn't happen. <laughs> you know? Like, my friend um, who prays, and she's the sort of person that only seeks the presence of God. She just rests in the fact that Jesus loves her and has done everything for her. And she spends her life seeking that presence. She doesn't really care about who this person is. They're quite good friends, actually, but she doesn't care who she is. She didn't even like football. She had free tickets to Chelsea, you know, and she didn't even care about going along to the game. Can you believe that? She doesn't care. That's why this, that God works in, the, in her life. And just like God wanted to work in the life of the Israelites, he wanted them to enter the promised land, but they didn't really want his presence. And he kept getting lost. And they kept wandering. And they kept not finding any rest. And the same rest is held out to us as Christians. There is a Sabbath rest to us all. And stop wandering. Stop finding um, rest in things that are not Christ. And I want to encourage you today to take this time to think about putting in place in your life a Sabbath rest. Whereby in the natural 
that you stop from doing task-oriented goals. You rejuvenate and you hang out with some other people. But also it's a time for spiritual rest, that you seek the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. You might not get a Brazilian footballer friend, but the promise of cassava rest in your life is held out to you, that you will find God showing up and his presence being there with you. All right, let me just uh, close to a prayer now.